Okay, so for the for this problem and the rest of the ones in this section, what we're going to be doing is they're going to tell us that we're going to assume that we can apply the mean value theorem. Then if we can, then we can go ahead and solve for it and get our answer for C. Now the questions are not going to ask you to determine whether mean value theorem can be applied, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about this through every one anyway, just so you can verify and see the steps and get more practice on determining whether mean value theorem can be applied. So let's do that for this one. So before we solve for C, let's first figure out if the mean value theorem can be applied. The first thing we have to do, so I'm assuming you've already watched the previous video that talks about all the conditions where the mean value theorem can be applied. The first one is that the function is continuous, the original function is continuous on the closed interval from A to B. We see right here that this is going to be a polynomial. We know that polynomials are continuous for every value of x between negative infinity and positive infinity. So therefore we know the first one's automatically the conditions already met because again it is continuous between negative 1 and 1. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the derivative. We're going to make sure that the derivative is also continuous on the open interval from negative 1 to 1. Let's do that now. Let's, let's find the derivative. Now before I find the derivative, normally I would have to do a product rule with this, but what we can do here is because there's only a single value for x, I'm just going to make this easier by multiplying through by x first because then all I have to do is apply the power rule. So when I do the derivative, and uh, for this one, I'm going to use the power rule, which means I'm going to bring powers down on this. So there it is. Find the power rule. I get this as my derivative. So this one right here is also a polynomial. We know it's also continuous on every number between negative 1 uh, and 1 open interval. So therefore, we know for sure that the mean value theorem can be applied. So, if the mean value theorem can be applied, then we know for sure we're guaranteed to find a C on our interval here that would satisfy this particular equation. So the thing we're going to do now is actually solve for this. So, I want to first start with the left hand side. That's the derivative with the C put in there. So I want to do is just take this one I just did and put a C in there for that one and then I'm going to set it equal to the right hand side. Now down below I have b minus a. Your a is always the first one and your b is the second one here. So we're going to do 1 minus negative 1. Now on top I have f of b and I have f of a. I'm going to work these out on the side first and then put them back in here. First let's find f of b. That would be f of 1. Okay, So f of 1, I need to put a 1 in. Now remember this formula on the right hand side says that we're working with the original function. So we have to use either one of these first two. You don't want to use this one because that's the derivative. You want to use one of these first two. I'll just use the uh, second version there. I have a 1 in here. I have 1 cubed minus 1 squared minus 2 times 1. If I work all that out, 1 minus 1 is 0. I get negative 2. So therefore, f of b is negative 2. I can just put that into the formula just like that. Next, I want to find f of a. Okay, so it's f of negative 1. Okay, I'm going to put that into this one. Negative 1 cubed minus negative 1 squared. And I get minus 2 times negative 1. Okay, so putting that in there, I'll get f of negative 1 is going to be equal to negative 1 minus 1 here because negative 1 squared is positive 1 plus 2. I have two negatives there. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2 plus 2 which means that f of negative 1 gives us a 0. So now I can put that into this part of the formula. I have this now. Once I have this complete and I filled in all the values, I now want to simplify it and then solve and, and I'll get my value for C. The values for C that I get should actually end up being between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so let's check that out now. I'm going to go ahead and erase this part. Okay, we get 3C squared minus 2C minus 2. If I simplify this, that's negative 2 over 2. That means I'll get a negative 1 on the right hand side. Again, by simplifying all this here. 
We have a quadratic. The way to solve quadratics would be to set them equal to zero. So I'm going to add a one to both sides. So I get 3c squared minus 2c. Add one to both sides. I get negative one here equals zero. You need to do a factoring step on that. We get 3c and c, one and one over here. We want the middle term to be negative, which means I have to have a negative here and a positive. When I set both of them equal to zero, I get negative one third, and I get one also. And both of these are included on my original interval, my closed interval, from A to B. So that means that that satisfies the mean value theorem because those two are included. So now that we've done these, what we're going to do next is I'm going to show you a graph because I always want to make sure you know physically what's happening when we do something like this. So that's what we'll do next. Let's take a look at the graph. Okay, so we've got negative one-third and one as our answers. Here's what the graph would look like for this one. So I have the one-third right here. That's my first uh, C value and I have one right here. Mean value theorem says that between negative one and one, that's my original uh, interval that I have there. The one-third falls in between that and we notice that the slope of the tangent line at the x value of one-third here, that's exactly the same as the slope that goes through b and a on this. So we're doing f of b and f of a. We found both of those. The slope going through there matches the slope at one-third. What about the other point? What about at one? Okay, well at one right here, that means the slope of the tangent line is actually drawn right on top of the other line that we have there. So you can't see that, but there's actually one line on top of the other. So of course, because they're both on top of each other, they would be considered equal slopes as well. So pictorially or visually, this is actually what's happening. Now you don't have to do a graph on all these problems. I'm not going to do graphs for any of the other examples that we're going to do in this section, but for this one I just wanted you to see what's physically happening.